Hello, everyone. It's nice to see everybody. I'm John Cavadini. I'm director of the Institute for Church Life. And on behalf of myself, and on behalf of Father Paul Coleman, director of the Center for Social Concerns, co-sponsoring our project, and also on behalf of Jessica Keating, director of the Office of Human Dignity and Life Initiatives, I'd like to welcome you all here. To believe in a father who loves all men and women with an infinite love means realizing that he thereby confers upon them an infinite dignity. To believe that the Son of God assumed our human flesh means that each human person has been taken up into the very heart of God. To believe that Jesus shed his blood for us removes any doubt about the boundless love which ennobles each human being. Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium. Friends, the Human Dignity Lecture is offered each year in the spirit of upholding and defending human dignity just as St. Francis articulated it. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. Martin F. Horn is Distinguished Lecturer in Corrections at the John Jay College, City University of New York, and serves as Executive Director of the New York State Sentencing Commission by appointment of the Chief Judge of the State of New York. He is also a Managing Director of Key Point Government Solutions, Incorporated. He was appointed by Mayor Michael Bloomberg to serve as Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation, effective January 1, 2002. A year later, Mayor Bloomberg appointed him to simultaneously serve as Commissioner of the New York City Department of Correction, the city's jail system. And he held both positions simultaneously until the end of July, 2009. As Correction Commissioner, Horn rebuilt morale accountability and integrity following a series of highly publicized scandals. He reduced suicides, cut jail violence in half. Several conditions of confinement lawsuits were satisfactorily resolved. He reduced the introduction of drugs into jail by initiating New York's first drug interdiction program, including the first wide-scale drug testing in the city's jails and he reduced suicides among inmates. He created the largest and most ambitious jail reentry program in the nation. He re-engineered the intake process to ensure all inmates were properly screened for vulnerability, possessed the documents needed to work upon release, created transitional job opportunities for persons released from jail, and created systems to identify high-frequency jail and shelter users. He worked with the city's housing and homeless services community to address the needs for housing of discharged persons. As probation commissioner, Horn implemented evidence-based practices, improving the delivery of treatment for addiction to alcohol and other drugs, employment of offenders, the department's IT capacity, and streamlining the probation violation process. As a result of his efforts, Recidivism among adult probationers dropped faster than in any other jurisdiction in New York State. His Project Zero effort led to major changes in the city's approach to juvenile delinquents, paving the way for a 70% reduction in the city's placement of juvenile delinquents and a tripling of the number of alleged delinquents diverted following arrest. Horn has lectured and written extensively about matters of prisons, security and reform, sentencing, the use of social isolation in prisons, reentry, and sentencing. Horn has testified before congressional committees and has been an expert consultant domestically and internationally, and has been an expert witness on behalf of both plaintiffs and governmental clients. I'm sure you'll join me all in welcoming, welcoming him as he comes to the podium to speak on the topic, prison reform, problematic necessity. <laughs> 
Thank you, John, for that warm introduction. And uh, it's really a, uh, an honor and a delight for me to be here this evening. Uh, one can't grow up in the United States and not know about Notre Dame and its history. And so to be invited to give uh, as important a lecture as this is to this community is, uh, is truly a, a privilege and an honor. Uh, I want to begin by, by thanking uh, John Cavadini and Jessica Keating uh, for everything, and, and also uh, Valerie McCants and Betsy Carnes for all their kindness and help in, in getting me out here. Uh, I want to thank uh, Father Paul Coleman uh, for uh, the support of, of his center and his interest that I learned about over dinner uh, in this issue. Uh, and I want to uh, also uh, say thank you to Jean and Bob McGrath, uh, who joined us for dinner this evening and uh, had with us, I think, a most uh, interesting conversation. Uh, and especially, I want to uh, say thank you and acknowledge some dear friends and former neighbors, your Vice President Paul Brown and his wife Sarah, who are uh, deep friends of my wife and myself. It's just a real treat for us to be here with you. Thank you. In every age, and as long as there have been prisons, there have been prison reformers. For centuries, people have been asking, why prisons? Do we need them? Who do we want to put in them? And for how long? What should the conditions of their confinement be? We like to think that the modern prison is an American invention, but it's not. Prisons have been around as far back as recorded history allows us to know. Wasn't Pharaoh kept in prison? Wasn't, wasn't Joseph? kept in prison by Pharaoh until he had his prophetic dream. And in 399 BC, didn't Socrates choose hemlock over prison? Didn't Matthew tell us that visiting the imprisoned is a requirement to enter the kingdom of God? So what do we learn from these lessons? We know prisons existed in antiquity. We know that visiting the prisoner was believed a good thing to do. And we also know that prison was not a very pretty prospect. I'd like to share with you some of my personal experiences and observations gained over a career of 40 years working with the imprisoned, the about to be imprisoned, and persons released from prison. I hope that together we can draw some lessons about the elusiveness of reform and conclude with some thoughts about how to make prisons less bad. What is imprisonment? It is the public imposition of involuntary physical confinement. It is treating lawbreakers in ways that would be legally and morally wrong to treat those who have not broken the law. It is punishment carried out by the state in our name. And because it is, each of us should be concerned with how it is accomplished. We trust that the way in which it is done is reasonable, fair, just, and humane. Can it ever be all that? Most of what people believe about prisons, they learn from the popular media. Law and order, Shawshank Redemption, lockup, and most recently, Orange is the New Black. These are the source of the impressions the general public shares about prisons. Reality is both better and worse. It is better insofar as the extent and frequency of the horrors depicted are less than these entertainments would lead us to believe. It's worse because the scale of imprisonment in the United States, over two million people locked up, and worse because of the grinding, corrosive effect of confinement even when it is not as brutal and mean as these depictions would show. The reality of prison life is most often ennui, interrupted by moments of horror. And the consequences of imprisonment go far beyond the walls of the prison. They affect the children, families, and neighborhoods in which the imprisoned live, 
and the political and economic dynamics of these communities as well. More than 10,000 children are in adult prisons and jails, and over 2.7 million children have a parent in prison or jail. This is an opportune time for us to be discussing the question of prisons and prison reform. Last spring, a committee of the National Research Council, chaired by my boss, John Jay College President Jeremy Travis, issued a groundbreaking report entitled The Growth of Incarceration in the United States. This committee of scholars said, quote, the growth in incarceration rates in the United States over the past 40 years is historically unprecedented and internationally unique, unquote. Their report challenges us to respond to this massive social experiment that our nation has undertaken. How do we respond to the mass incarceration of over two million people in our country? The panel concluded that the change in penal policy over the past four decades may have had a wide range of unwanted social costs, and the magnitude of crime reduction benefits is uncertain. They went on to add that an explicit and transparent expression of normative principles has been missing and is needed to supplement empirical evidence to guide future policy. In other words, as a community, we need to decide what is it we want of our prisons. Crime and imprisonment affect discrete sections of our communities. Prisoners in every jurisdiction come from just a small number of communities, mostly concentrated in the poorest neighborhoods with the least resources and the most problems of health, housing, and nutrition. One cannot divorce the discussion of imprisonment from the discussion of race in our country. As a result of federal census rules and federal funding schemes, we redirect money away from communities in need to prison communities. And through discriminatory voting rules, we diminish the electoral power of the most poor and disenfranchised communities. Most prisoners are men between the ages of 18 and 35, and they are disproportionately black and Latino. This is the time young men should be building their lives, their families, their careers. It is a time when young men are at their most vital, physical, social, and aggressive. Confinement and loss of liberty runs against the grain of their nature. We ask prisons to do what our society has otherwise been able to do with and for these young men. Many of them have been failed in or failed by the other institutions we rely on to socialize members of our community, often including their own families. They have been left to live on their own, been abused or raised in state institutions. They have left the church, been suspended or expelled from school. They have been homeless and often suffer from untreated mental illness. Many have not finished high school and are functionally illiterate. Most of them have not held jobs or have worked intermittently at best. Estimates are that over 70% enter prison with addiction to alcohol and other drugs. As a civilized society, how can we explain the fact that by some estimates, over 30% of the persons in prison have mental health problems? In jails around the country, New York City, for example, over 40% of the prisoners were diagnosed as mentally ill. How can we allow that? The sociologist Irving Goffman observed in 1957 that total institutions, his term, such as prisons, create barriers to social intercourse and are incompatible with the natural, social, and associative character of man. The way people respond to their confinement in this unnatural situation 
often leads to the very behaviors we wish to extinguish and frequently make them worse. Imprisonment is stigmatizing and the language we use, inmates, convicts, guards, keepers, as well as our reluctance to have them in our midst, leads to their further dehumanization. It encourages those tasked with their custody to treat prisoners as less than full citizens. We place our prisons far away from the communities the imprisoned come from. Rather than keeping our prisoners near us, near their families, and near the services they desperately need to reclaim their lives, we isolate them. When we do this, we send a not so subtle message that they are the detritus of our society, untouchables, not deserving of our care. I have visited and worked in many prisons throughout my career. I've come to the conclusion that the prison, by its very nature, is a flawed institution, destructive of human dignity. Even at its best, prisons are menacing environments. Bullying behavior is no stranger to our high schools. We should not be surprised when it takes brutal shape in our prisons and jails. We call them gangs. A young man locked up in the US today is confronted by one set of bullies or another. Prisons and jails are environments of enforced scarcity. We don't allow prisoners to have cigarettes, sex, alcohol, or drugs. We don't allow them to have contact with their loved ones, forcing them to use limited numbers of phones, often at exorbitant prices. Typically, there are only one or maybe two televisions in a prison or jail housing unit, and 50 or more prisoners competing to determine what gets watched and who gets the good seats. When we create this artificial scarcity, some of it, by the way, necessary, we create an environment where an underground economy emerges, controlling access to these much wanted items and pleasures. It is controlled by the strongest and denied to the weakest. In every prison and jail I have seen, a pecking order emerges. I want your sneakers. I want potato chips you bought in the commissary. You have family and money and can pay for phone calls. I don't, and I want what you have. I want you to clean my cell, do my laundry, or service me sexually. I want to watch baseball on TV. You want to watch soccer. I want the front row seat. I want drugs. I sell drugs. And I want your sister to bring drugs into the prison for me when she next visits. All these things become matters for negotiation and control. If I am not strong enough myself, I join with others to extort what I want from weaker prisoners. If I am not strong enough and can't join with others, I arm myself with whatever I can for protection. And where is the guard? The very fact people call them guards, rather than prison officers or corrections officers, tells us a great deal about how society undervalues their work and its challenges. They receive none of the adulation we reserve for police officers and firefighters. They spend their days in uninterrupted contact with the people we most detest. We should not be surprised when they are dispirited and angry. As a result of decisions made by elected officials, often in response to dramatic media attention to small numbers of sensational crimes, the number of people in our prisons grew dramatically in the 1980s and 90s. Prison officials faced severe overcrowding and could not build prisons and jails fast enough. The public did not want to pay for the high cost of building secure prisons with cells and small housing units. Rather, prisons have come to rely on open dormitory housing, similar to military barracks, as a fast way to build and a low-cost way of responding to the demand for prison space. <laughs> 
In a dormitory with more than 50 others, one has no privacy, no solitude, no place to contemplate or be alone with one's thoughts. These dormitories may well be the worst thing that has happened to prisons. Imagine the single correction officer charged with policing that dormitory at 3 a.m. The officer smells a whiff of marijuana from the farthest corner of the room. Will he intervene when that means putting 50 prisoners between himself and the door? Help means other officers who can come to your aid if the prisoners decide to overwhelm you. But that help is several minutes away in the best of circumstances. What choice would you make? Often, officers make the choice to ignore the behavior. In that moment, the officer is compromised. And not all behaviors are seen by the officer. While the officer is responding to the marijuana smoker, another prisoner is attempting suicide in the shower area out of view. Or two prisoners are fighting in the day room, another area outside his view. The officer's job is near impossible. A dormitory, such as I have described, cannot be adequately policed in this way. I think most correction officers are terrified much of the time. As they gain seniority, most move away from the prisoner living units to posts on the perimeter, the wall, the visiting room, what we refer to as non-contact positions. As a result, where the inmates live is typically staffed by the least experienced officers. Accommodations get made. A devil's bargain, if you will, gets struck. Between the officer and the prisoner, leave me alone and I will leave you alone. The officer turns a blind eye to extortion, minor contraband, sexual encounters, and in return, the prisoners don't turn their violence against the officer. Once the officer is compromised, he can be extorted into collusion, bringing in contraband drugs or cell phones or cigarettes, and in the worst case, using the prisoners to enforce discipline. Sometimes the officers themselves become a gang, relying on brutality to control and intimidate the prisoners into compliance. Jails are worse. In jails around the country, little effort is made to occupy, teach, or rehabilitate the inmates. They are merely awaiting trial. So the prisoners sit around with nothing to do but watch television and wait for their case to be heard in court. The overwhelming atmosphere in most jails is boredom. In addition to the bullying and violence already described, with so much unstructured time on their hands, young men engage in horse horseplay that often escalates to violence. In some jails in this country, there is not even an officer on the cell block full time. Staff is often part time and rarely well trained. There are over 3,000 jails in the United States, most of them in small counties. Much has been written in the last several years about prison rape. While rape in the sense we commonly understand it is a relatively infrequent occurrence, other forms of unwanted sexual contact is experienced by about 4% of the prisoners. As a function of over 2 million prisoners, it affects roughly 8,000 prisoners a year. Surprisingly, it is not the movie version of the predatory male officer attacking the female prisoner, though that occurs. The most frequent encounter is between female officers and prisoners. For the average prisoner, confinement is a frightening experience. Most of all, you want to be safe. And if the administration of the prison doesn't make you feel safe, you will do what you need to do to get to that feeling of safety. That's why prisoners arm themselves, and that's why they join gangs, to feel safe. Imprisonment is especially hard on those with mental illness. In an open dormitory, your neighbor screams in hallucinations at night or is argumentative. 
or fails to properly care for himself after using the toilet. Fights break out. Rural jails and prisons face a particular problem with respect to prisoners with mental illness. I have seen situations where small jails are asked to confine psychotic prisoners and there is not a psychiatrist within 100 miles. What is the jailer to do? Often, their only recourse is to place the prisoner in a solitary cell, making matters worse. But putting the prisoner in population, often in a dormitory, is not better. There are places that don't have proper juvenile detention facilities. Youngsters who are arrested are placed in solitary confinement because regulations require they be separated from adults and there is no other way to accomplish that. And how do these young men do when they return home? And they almost all do. And to the very communities they came from. Many fail to successfully complete their paroles. The most recent study of recidivism found that 55%, 55% of those released returned to prison within five years. We don't return people to their communities from prison in a smart way that is designed to promote their success. We release them to communities that further ostracize them through hiring biases, laws that prohibit them from working in many jobs, and exclusionary policies in public and private housing. For the most part, we release them to a parole officer who is overworked with more cases than he or she can reasonably be expected to assist. Frequently, over 100 cases are assigned to an officer who works 40 hours or less. And that officer rarely, rarely has the resources to do the job we ask. Nonetheless, we expect that officer to know when the released person breaks the rules and to protect us by sending the released person back to prison before he or she can harm us. And we blame the parole officer when he doesn't. When a man or woman leaves prison, they need three things to succeed, in my opinion. They must remain sober. They need a place to live, and they need a job. They need all three simultaneously. Typically, parole agencies do not invest in providing resources to assist their charges to stay sober, expecting them to do it by force of will. They don't invest money in helping people on parole find and keep work, relying instead on the parolee to do it. And in a world where affordable housing in urban areas is becoming more and more dear, they don't provide assistance in finding a place to live. Why then are we surprised when they return to prison? None of this is new. It's been true as long as there have been prisons. And the imperative for reform is equally old. When we think about imprisonment, we have to learn from history. Prisons and jails appear in Western Europe beginning in the 12th century. But execution, torture, mutilation, and loss of property remain the common forms of punishment for crime. As feudalism ended and society elevated the value of personal freedom, among lay citizens, the loss of liberty through imprisonment became a possible method for punishing crime. In England, the parliament established workhouses to deal with growing numbers of vagrants, pickpockets, and petty criminals filling the streets of London. These were grim places where the confined were forced to labor under harsh conditions, subject to physical punishment and where the prisoner's lot was determined by his station in life, his wealth, and his family. Typically, the jailers were not paid, and the prisoners were dependent on family for food, clothing, and bedding. Or they had to find ways to bribe the jailer or take it from another prisoner to obtain the necessity of life. Exile was one of the reforms that the British tried. The settling of Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, and South Carolina was partly accomplished by the transportation of British criminals 
to those colonies beginning in 1615 and lasting until the time of the Revolution. The Enlightenment brought with it concern about the harshness and cruelty being leveled at lawbreakers. What use of prisons and jails there was at the time was marked by pestilential, dangerous, and overcrowded conditions, and the continuing practice of jailers charging the prisoners for food, bedding, and clothing. In the early years of our republic, we continued to employ corporal and capital punishment, mutilation, and shaming as our response to crime. The few jails that there were rivaled their British counterparts in wretched conditions, unsanitary and unsafe. American prisons were established in the belief that the terror of imprisonment was necessary to achieve its purposes of remorse and reformation. In 1787, a group of men, including several signers of the Declaration of Independence, gathered in Philadelphia at the home of Benjamin Franklin. They founded the Philadelphia Society for the Alleviation of the Miseries of Prisoners. The central idea in their approach to prison reform was simply that every person, regardless of crimes committed, was redeemable. They believed solitary confinement was the best way to reform the criminal. They thought the prisoner, locked in his or her cell at all times, with no contact with other prisoners or the outside world, would meditate on their misdeeds, study the Bible, the only item the prisoner was allowed to read, they never seemed to have thought about the prisoner who couldn't read, and without contamination from other criminals and evil influences would repent and lead law-abiding lives after their sentence ended. In fact, they called this institution a penitentiary. Prisoners worked alone in their cells, making shoes, caning chairs, or weaving cloth. When they left their cells, prisoners were hooded, and the prison itself was an architectural marvel designed to facilitate this solitary existence. When the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia opened in 1827, William White, then the Episcopal Bishop of Philadelphia, said, quote, to Pennsylvania belongs the honor of having begun the whole system of prison reformation. And William Crawford, an English visitor in 1835, wrote a report to the king saying, quote, solitary imprisonment is not only an exemplary punishment, but a powerful agent in the reformation of morals. It inevitably tends to arrest the progress of corruption. Charles Dickens visited the same prison his observations were somewhat different. He wrote, quote, I am persuaded that those who devised this system of prison discipline and those benevolent gentlemen who carry it into execution do, know, do not know what it is they are doing. I believe that very few men are capable of estimating the immense amount of torture and agony which this dreadful punishment prolonged for years inflicts upon the sufferers. More recently, in 2013, the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Torture, Juan Mendez, called solitary confinement for more than 15 days torture. So much for that reform. In 1890, 1819, pardon me, New York opened its new prison at Auburn, in which prisoners were housed in single cells, but unlike in Pennsylvania, they were allowed to work and eat and recreate in congregate settings, but were expected to observe a rule of strict silence, enforced by officers using brutal punishments. This model was believed to be more cost-effective and less conducive to the mental deterioration being seen in Pennsylvania. But this reform, too, brought with it a return to corporal punishment that the penitentiary was intended to replace as harsh penalties were employed to punish inmates who broke the silence. No surprise. The other new idea the Auburn reforms led to was the belief that prisoners should be engaged in productive activity, making them an economic asset rather than a liability to the state. 
Convict leasing, the practice of private parties paying the state a fee for the use of prisoners in privately owned factories, farms, mines, and plantations became a common practice throughout the country and not just in the South. In New York, convict leasing was permitted until 1894. In the 1860s, prison overcrowding was prevalent, partly because of the long sentences being given out for violent crimes. In 1870, the National Prison Congress set out an agenda for reform. Prisoners would be reformed through education and vocational training. Instead of fixed sentences, prisoners who did well could be released early. This, quote, indeterminate sentence was considered a significant step toward protecting the public from the criminals by transforming them into productive and law-abiding citizens. This indeterminate sentence is probably what you are all most familiar with from the movies and television. It's the sentence where the judge sets it out, but the determination on the actual release of the prisoner is made by a parole board. You're familiar with the 5 to 10, the 2 to 6, the 10 to 20, the 25 to life. What does that mean? Is the prisoner sentenced to 5 or to 10? 10 or 20? 25 or life? The social historian David Rothman referred to parole as a game of chance. And he wrote that no change that progressives brought to criminal justice had more significant consequences than the system of parole under an indeterminate sentence. The introduction of the indeterminate sentence and parole encouraged and promoted an increase in time served. <clears throat> parole satisfied nobody, yet it has shown remarkable staying power. It plays a cruel hoax on everybody, especially the public. At the time of the Attica prison riot in 1971, the unfairness, unpredictability, and arbitrary nature of parole was at the heart of the prisoner's complaints. Its ill effects are made worse by the plea negotiations that have come to dominate our disposition of criminal complaints. I have heard prisoners who are denied parole complain that they were assured by their defense attorney that if they kept their nose clean, they would be paroled at the end of their minimum term. The parole board wasn't in the room when that deal got made. And I have heard from victims, outraged, that the criminal some prosecutor assured them was going away for life got released after only 25 years. Again, the parole board wasn't in the room when that deal got made. It undermines public confidence and respect for our system of justice. It embitters the prisoner and betrays the victim. And increasingly there is evidence that parole has not contributed substantially to reduced recidivism or increased public safety. Yet, parole has continued to be the practice in many states for well over a century. In 1914, Thomas Mott Osborne, one of the country's most revered prison reformers, experimented with something called prisoner self-government by creating the Mutual Welfare League at the Auburn and Sing Sing prisons in New York. But because there's always a pecking order in prison, the New York Times reported in 1916 that, quote, certain of the trustees, whom the other prisoners refer to as league politicians, were permitted to have eggs, steak, and other food served to them in a dining room as a special privilege. The Times went on to report that the new warden was ending that practice. <clears throat> At the beginning of the 20th century, psychiatric interpretations of social deviance gained a central role in criminology and policymaking. The language of medicine was applied in an attempt to cure offenders of their criminality. In fact, little was known about the causes of their behavior, and prescriptions were not much different from the earlier reforms. The reformers believed they could transform the nightmarish prison dedicated to punishment into a community that would prepare the inmate for release and serve as a testing ground for society. They were wrong. 
1974, the American Correctional Association established its Commission on Accreditation for Corrections, and the American Bar Association in 1983 adopted standards for the legal status of prisoners. They said their purpose was to guide the operation of American jails and prisons in order to pr help protect prisoners' rights while promoting safety, humaneness, and the effectiveness of our correctional facilities. Today, some suggest we emulate the model of European nations. Recently, colleagues of mine visited the maximum security Holden prison in Norway, housing prisoners serving average sentences of seven years which, by the way, is long by Norwegian standards. In Norway, the rule is that the only right an offender loses is their right to liberty. They retain all other rights, just like every other citizen. And as a corollary, they believe, the prison experience should be designed to approximate, as much as possible, life on the outside. In Norway, prisoners sleep in hotel-sized rooms with a picture window, a private toilet, shower, sink, equipped with a small flat screen TV and a small dormitory sized refrigerator. They can buy necessities at the on-site supermarket or utilize a library with access to the latest magazines, computers, and internet access. They may visit with loved ones in a private room furnished with a couch and a cupboard containing clean linens. Staff at Holden say, we don't punish prisoners, we give them time to calm down. Holden costs about $1 million per cell to construct. And it operates with 340 staff for 250 prisoners. Yet, Norway reports a national recidivism rate of only 20% after three years. Far better than our 55% rate. They are willing to pay this high front-end price in the belief it is the best and most economical path to public safety. Perhaps this is a model for the United States, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. Despite reforms and the best efforts of committed prison and jail administrators, we continue to witness the failure of American prisons and jails. Why? I submit it is because the very act of imprisonment is contrary to the nature of man. Goffman got it right, and every day we see maladaptive behavior by prisoners and their keepers. His theory was confirmed in 1971 when Stanford University psychologist Philip Zimbardo tried an experiment that no institutional review board would allow today. Zimbardo constructed a fake prison in the basement of a university building and randomly assigned half the students as guards and half as prisoners. After only six days, the planned two-week experiment was called off as ordinary college students were transformed into either brutal statistic guards or emotionally broken prisoners. Zimbardo called this the Lucifer effect. He said, the social setting and the system contaminate the individual rather than the other way around. I don't subscribe to the idea that we can live without prisons. They serve an important public safety function by preventing the predatory dangerous offender from doing it again. We call that incapacitation, and prison does that well. Further, prison serves the important social function of reinforcing our social norms by punishing those who break the law in an important symbolic fashion. We have to avoid social anomie and vigilantism by having a justice system that regularizes and rationalizes the imposition of vengeance. Prison and punishment have important normative functions, but we pay a price. Prisons will never be perfect. The very act of imprisonment is destructive of human dignity. We ask much of our prisons. We ask they protect us from dangerous people, that they send a message that deters others from committing bad acts. We ask that they rehabilitate prisoners and that they exact vengeance in our name. The fact is, no matter how well managed, prisons can't do all that. So what should we do? Because the prison is such a destructive place, above all, we need to be clear about its purpose and mindful of its limitations. 
Imprisonment is flawed and imperfect. Therefore, the first thing we should do is use it less. One way to have fewer prisoners would be to improve the chances for their success following release. Nationally, parole violation rates have increased substantially in the last 25 years, and in many states, parole violators account for a significant number and share of state prison admissions. In New York, last year, fully one-third of all admissions to state prisons were failed parolees. With fewer prisons, we will have an opportunity to close old prisons located in areas far from the neighborhoods the prisoners come from. It will allow us to rely less on the open dormitory and possibly to make our prisons smaller. Prisons with 2,000 or more prisoners are difficult to manage. Decades of draconian laws driven by singular events, think about Megan Kanka, Len Bias, Willie Horton, have driven prison populations up. We are beginning to see elected officials backing away from these ill-advised projects. In New York, the severe penalties of the Rockefeller drug laws were revised, and the prison population dropped by over 20,000 while crime kept coming down. Grover Norquist and Newt Gingrich are campaigning for repeal of mandatory sentences and a reduction in prison use, hopefully because they understand the futility of mass incarceration and not just because it costs a lot. But it's a beginning. Because we need prisons, and because prisons will always be flawed, even as we reduce our reliance on them, we must continue to try to make them better. Rather than reforms aimed at changing the prisoner, I suggest we need to reform the institutions that harm the prisoners. I'd like to share with you 10 thoughts for ways to make prison less bad. First, increase transparency. In 2008, the American Bar Association's House of Delegates approved a resolution urging federal, state, and local governments to establish independent oversight bodies to regularly monitor and report publicly on conditions in correctional facilities. It's a good idea, and every state should establish such bodies. Transparency recognizes that prisons and jails deprive our neighbors of their liberty in our name. As citizens, all of us must take an interest in the condition of our prisons and jails or nothing will change. We bear responsibility for them and we must remain vigilant daily about their operation. And bearing witness both to the best and the worst that occurs balances the misrepresentations in the media with the truth about imprisonment. It is our civic duty. If our prisons and jails are hellish, it is because we allow them to be. Additionally, we could further transparency if, as we close prisons, we first close those furthest from the communities most prisoners come from. And if in the future we build, we should do so in those communities so all can witness them and where advocates, clergy, attorneys, and family members can easily visit the prisoners and where the symbolic effect of imprisonment can be most effectively seen. Second, prisons and jails are the wrong place for the mentally ill. Prisons and jails are the wrong place for the mentally ill. When the great experiment in deinstitutionalization was begun in the 1960s, it was intended to be accompanied by the creation of a robust community mental health system. That never happened. And where it did, it did not reach our neediest neighbors in poor communities of color. We overestimated the utility of psychotropic medication. Many of the men and women we see in prison and jail are there because they are self-medicating, trying to ease their discomfort with alcohol, cocaine, and heroin because they don't like the adverse side effects of the drugs that have been prescribed for them. They turn to illegal drugs get caught up in the war on drugs we have been fruitlessly waging these last 50 years, and that is part of the reason we see so many mentally ill prisoners. We can change that by investing the resources and energy in finding ways to reach and help these people 
that does not criminalize their behavior. Third, if prisons and jails are to be humane, they must be safe. Prisoners whose confinement is an experience in brutality are less likely to succeed when they are released. To do this, we must resolve that they be drug free. Recently, a close colleague who runs one of the biggest prison systems in the country told me drug testing at several of his prisons found over 20% of the prisoners using drugs. Drug use in prison is what fuels violence and corruption and is the economic engine from which prison gangs derive their power. Everything I know and have learned tells me that when we substantially reduce access to drugs in prisons and jails, they become safer for the prisoners and the staff. Yet, in too many prisons and jails today, access to drugs is commonplace and accepted. That must end. There are ways to do it, and every jurisdiction should accept that as their goal. Next, prisons should be places where prisoners learn that respect for the law and for others is how people in civil society behave. This means that the staff must respect the law and each other, as well as the persons in their custody. We must build within our prisons a culture of integrity. We won't teach prisoners to obey the law by breaking it, and we don't teach respect for the rules by violating them. How prison staff relates to each other and to the prisoners is the most powerful way to teach the prisoner how to be part of a civil community. The goal of prison should be to release better citizens, not better criminals. Fifth, today, one cannot expect to find work if one cannot read and write. There is no excuse for prisoners not educating all prisoners to at least the high school level and even beyond. We can teach people how to work, even if we can't teach everyone to be a skilled machinist or a computer technician. Work ennobles us. Work gives us an identity. Whether one is painting the prison, peeling potatoes, or fixing its plumbing, one can learn to take pride in one's work, to be responsible, to work cooperatively with others, and to accept supervision. These are skills everyone needs on the outside. Prisons and jails can do these things. They are better at doing these things than they are at psychology. Sixth, prisons and jails should adopt performance management techniques similar to the NYPD's famous CompStat to track progress in promoting the safety of prisoners, staff, and the public, and to hold managers accountable for the results. As the saying goes, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And the management of safety in prisons must be their highest priority. There are models for doing this and they should be replicated. Seven, let's end the demonization of prisoners. Let's embrace the notion that the people in prison are our neighbors, the children of our community, and deserving of our concern. They are all returning home to the places they left, and it is in our self-interest to see that they return with better prospects and better equipped to succeed than when they left. We do this not for them, but for us. The National Academies report suggested that in addition to being parsimonious in our use of prison and limiting punishment to that which is appropriate to the crime, we should ask of our prison system that it recognize and promote the citizenship of prisoners and that it operate in a fashion that is consistent with social justice and promote society's aspirations for a fair distribution of rights, resources, and opportunities. Behaving that way should obligate prison officials and our communities to adopt a standard of care that tells us to treat every prisoner as we would want our own son or daughter treated if they were imprisoned. It should cause our communities to accept their responsibility 
for the reintegration of these formerly incarcerated persons and not expect the state to take care of it. Eight, prisons can't change outcomes themselves. They need the support and the help of caring communities, faith communities, business and leaders willing to lend a hand by helping the man or woman released from prison to find a job, find a place to live. When the prisoner is released, we cannot walk away from our responsibility to assist in his or her successful return. The state should invest in helping the released prisoner to find a place to live, to find a job, to remain sober. If not, the failure is as much ours as the prisoner's. We have to rethink the way in which prisoners return to their communities. Our present system of sentencing and parole does not support successful reentry to society. We should seriously consider fixed sentences, graduated release to halfway houses, and more assistance to the released rather than surveillance. Nine, despite huge expenditures, we have been miserly with the money needed to provide prison and jail officials the tools they need to do their job the way we wish it to be done. One of the great shames of our society today is the large number of prisoners in segregation, what some call solitary confinement. Unfortunately, in prison, as in the community at large, there are people who break the rules and a response is required. There are prisoners who are so dangerous that our obligation to the safety of the other prisoners requires them to be separated. But we need not and should not engage in the practice of solitary confinement. Simply put, it is wrong. Extreme social isolation is damaging and inconsistent with our desire to return people to their communities as productive law-abiding citizens. When prisoners must be segregated, the prison assumes responsibility to counteract the ill effects of extreme social isolation. With sufficient resources and with fewer mentally ill persons in prison and jail, administrators could find other, better ways to enforce the rules and keep everyone safe. Finally, we must repair the damage we have done to the communities most prisoners return to. We know that the unemployment rate for young black men is nearly 25%, twice that for young white men. That economic disadvantage is perpetuated by policies that deny education, housing, and jobs to the formerly incarcerated, and policies that count prisoners in the census where they are imprisoned rather than in the communities they come from. It is made worse by disenfranchising them and allocating legislative seats to districts based on counting prisoners in the prisons rather than counting the prisoners as part of the district where they lived before going to prison. These policies dilute the power of poor communities of color while enhancing the power of prison communities. This is unfair and we should put an end to it. I don't believe poverty causes crime. In fact, I've always marveled at how many people in poverty live with dignity and respect for the law despite their desperate circumstances. Our rapidly changing post-industrial society has left many behind and people leaving prison are among the hardest hit. If we don't find ways to help these young men and women rejoin the workforce and our civil society, we run the risk of making them worse, the very thing we expect prison reform to prevent. When John Cavadini invited me to deliver this lecture, I tried to find a way to speak about my life's work for this audience in this setting and give it meaning within the concept of human dignity. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan, schooled in catechism, I suspect, wrote, even the vilest criminal remains a human being possessed of common human dignity. And more recently, just as Anthony Kennedy wrote for the Roberts Court, prisoners retain the essence of human dignity inherent in all persons. Still, I thought, what did they mean by human dignity? Cardinal Timothy Dolan's 2011 lecture from this podium helped me to understand the concept of human dignity better. 
His eminence instructed us that being in the image of God, the human individual possesses a dignity of a person who is not just something, but someone. And so I believe our concern for the imprisoned is a concern for the someone who was imprisoned, a fellow, a neighbor, a person possessing human dignity and notwithstanding his or her de deeds, deserving of our consideration for that reason alone. Human dignity is at the very heart of why we are interested in prison reform. Interest in prison reform and the condition of the imprisoned is as central to faith as it is to good citizenship in the United States today. And I pray my remarks here today have contributed to your understanding. Thank you. I can't tell you who's going to win on Saturday. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Michelle. I am Canadian, and I'm studying in the LLM program in international human rights law. Um, I was wondering what you think of, um, I wouldn't say f it's not forced labor, obviously, but the practice of having prisoners work for very low wages for profit for companies. Um, we, you didn't speak about this, and I was interested in knowing your opinion. Um, obviously, uh, um, that it is a system that is um, open to abuse and rife with abuse, and there have been examples throughout history of um, private entities uh, bribing government officials in order to have prisoners work for them at below market wages. Uh, it's a complex issue. I think we want inmates, prisoners, to work, we don't want them to be idle all day. Um, they should be compensated for their work. Uh, but at the same time, a reasonable argument can be made that if they're working and if they're earning a wage, that the state that is providing for their room and board has the right to deduct the cost of that room and board and uh, reduce their wages thereby. Um, I think that the contracting out prisoners to private companies has historically been a mistake, and we shouldn't be doing it. When prisoners work, they should be working in the prison. There are lots of things to do in the prison, from mopping floors to painting walls to helping to fix the electrical to cooking the meals to washing the dishes to doing the laundry to baking the bread. There are enough jobs in a prison to keep prisoners busy, and they should work for the state. Mr. Horn, you didn't speak about the privatization of prisons and the political effect of, um, it's almost contrary to everything that you've described about uh, decreasing the amount of incarcerated in the United States. Right. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I very firmly believe that this country has to make a conscious choice to lock fewer people up, and there are lots of ways we can do that. We can change our bail practices and reduce our reliance on jails. We can rethink our war on drugs, as New York has done, and, and substantially reduce the number of people in prison. We can think about how long people go to prison. Um, with respect to private prisons, there, let me say a couple of things. Um, it's a complicated issue. Uh, I do not subscribe to the belief that uh, longer sentences or the uh, mass incarceration that we have experienced in this country is the result of efforts by private prison companies to drive it. There are enough forces at work without that. Prison officers unions, you know, the, the most influential union in the state of California are the prison officers. Uh, they are the largest contributor to campaigns and they're also uh, the strongest supporter of organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving pushing for longer penalties. Uh, and that is true in other places, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York. Uh, 
um, where prison unions have a vested interest in seeking more prisons and more prisoners. Uh, I think the prison industry, the private prison industry, arose in response to the inability of government to build prisons and keep pace with the demand for prisons driven by the hysteria of the 80s and the 90s. Uh, I, think, I think that running a prison is not rocket science. And um, I've been to private prisons and I've been to public, I've been to some public prisons that are detestable. Uh, and I've been to some private prisons that are more well run than any pu public prison I've been to. I think the responsibility rests with the government. It's like any government service. It's like contracting out. If Notre Dame contracts out food service, then the vice president for administration or whoever does that contract at Notre Dame is responsible if the food service provider provides lousy food and they have to enforce the contract. And the same is true if I'm a prison administrator and I enter into a contract with a private provider, it's my responsibility to ensure that those private prisons are run the way I want them to run. Now, unfortunately, what happens is that money does get paid, and as with the question about private employment, um, people don't do their jobs as effectively as we want them to do. But that's true in every area where government contracts. Well, I had one question, but I'll change it. For instance, in Indiana, one of the ways that private pr prisons and, say, private food services have been able to get contracts are to basically underbid what the state was providing. However, they're able to underbid because the quality of food they are serving is less than what the state was serving. So there's no way that you could serve um, nutritional food, there's no way that you could serve um, food that people want to eat and all uh, if you were doing the standards that the state used to do. So how do you get people to understand just because Aramark comes in and says we can feed prisoners for three dollars a day and the state was feeding them for five dollars a day. The difference is, you know, Aramark for instance um, considers, what do you call it, black-eyed peas as a meat on their menu. So how do you get people to understand that's why the privatization is able to save so much money? You're absolutely right, and, I, and my answer is the same. It's the responsibility of the government. If I were to write a contract with a private provider for food service, I would specify exactly what the nutritional content as well as the ingredients of the meals that I expect to be served are. I would say, I expect meat to be served four, night, four days a week, five days a week, and here's what constitutes meat. And it's not soy, right? I would say, I expect uh, meals to have no more than so much sodium and no more than so much fat. And I expect every inmate to be given X number of pieces of bread at every meal and so many pieces of fruit, by fruit I mean an orange, banana, an apple, at every meal. And I would be very specific in writing that contract. And if the state of Indiana didn't write the contract with sufficient specificity, or if they did and then didn't enforce it, then again, I would put the responsibility on the state and the state officials. But then the elected official who allowed that to happen has to own that responsibility and be faulted for it. I mean, you can't do that. That's right. You're exactly right. The, the contract has to specify how many calories, what the nutritional value is. Every prison in, and jail that I ran, we had a professional PhD dietitian on staff who said, here's what the inmates can eat. And when Mayor Bloomberg in New York City said we were going to reduce the sodium content in all the food that was served in the city schools and in the city hospitals and in the city jails, the dietitian figured out how to do it. If I were to, we provided the service ourselves. If I had contracted it out, I would have had my dietitian write out what the, we, we printed our menus. We could tell you what the menu was every day, what the quantity, how many ounces of 
potato, how many ounces of green beans, how many ounces of chopped meat or Salisbury steak or whatever it was we were serving. And you could write a contract that said, you know, these are sample menus, this is what the rotation should be. And again, the fault rests with the state. I'm not excused. Look, private companies are voracious and they will get away with as much as government allows them to get away with. But if government allows them to get away with it, shame on government. I hope that was responsive. Just wanted to bring forth another point about the mentally ill who are incarcerated. And oftentimes they're put into a rubber lined room with a hole in the floor and they're left there in solitary to take care of themselves and they self mutilate. Inexcusable. Inexcusable. Hi. Um, I first want to thank you for such an engaging discussion. And um, like you said, a lot of this isn't new, but it's still stuff that needs to be changed. And so I actually have two questions for, for you. One is what can we as citizens and communities and such um, do to help prison reform? It's a huge task and I think sometimes it gets very overwhelming as one person. We see change needs to be made but don't know what we as an individual can do. And my second question is about your experience in this more positive um, prison reformation process and especially with, you talked about how prisons are not a place for the mentally ill and talked about the relationship between addiction and, and mental illness. And I'm curious also about your thoughts on um, addiction as a disease and you discussed a little bit about how we need to rethink the war on, on drugs and that's been done a little bit in New York. So I think I you're up to your third question. <laughs> All right, if you could just expand on some of that, that'd be great. Thank um, you. What was the first question? <laughs> so, look, I mean, I think every one of us can find something we can do as a citizen. Uh, you know, a simple thing is write, you know, write your legislature and tell them that uh, the state of Indiana should a appoint a civilian oversight board that has the ability to inspect prisons uh, on behalf of the citizens and issue public reports about what's going on in the prisons. That's a simple thing that every state, every county could do. The, this county could have such a board that oversees its county jail. City of New York has a, has a board that had oversight of the city jail. So that's a simple thing to do. A second thing to do is to uh, volunteer at an organization. Take, take, take the responsibility that, accept the responsibility that the people who are in prison are your neighbors, your fellow citizens, they're coming back to your community, and work with an organization that helps returning prisoners return to the community. Um, so that's volunteer to tutor. In, in a prison, or better yet, in a juvenile program that helps to keep kids from going to prison in the first place. Um, the second question with respect to the mentally ill, I, that's, a, that's a hugely complex question, and one of my colleagues has said to me, look, there's no mystery to it. S state lawmakers figured out a long time ago that it costs a lot of money to keep the mentally ill in a state hospital, and it costs a lot less to put them in prison, and quite frankly, the state hospitals weren't doing any better so they just allow them to go to prisons. It requires that policymakers at every state, you know, at the state level in every state, rethink their approach to how we deal with the mentally ill and create mechanisms that uh, give police officers who arrest people who are obviously mentally ill some options. Um, the, there was a case you may have read about in New York, a fellow by the name of uh, Jerome McDonough, the guy who supposedly baked in his cell. Um, he was a, a veteran, and he was mentally ill, and he had a history of mental illness, and he was arrested for uh, sleeping in the stairwell of a public housing project. And he was arrested on, on a criminal trespass or a vagrancy charge, which in New York City is a pretty minor offense. It's an important quality of life offense, but it's, it's not bank robbery. Um, and he went before the judge, and he had a lawyer, and there was a prosecutor, and the prosecutor, this was a destitute homeless guy, the prosecutor asked that the judge set bail at $5,000. He might as well have said $10 million. And all I could think to myself is, wasn't there some other option? What was that lawyer thinking? And where was the judge? Judges need tools. Judges need mental health courts. We need to have public 
hospitals and emergency rooms that have the capacity to take these individuals, uh, where, where an individual like this could be uh, brought by the police officer. And in many communities around the country, there are not enough of them. New York is fortunate. New York actually has, New York City has a very robust mental health capacity. But you leave New York City and you go to upstate communities, or I'm sure there are communities here in Indiana where there's not a, a, a psychiatric facility for, for miles and miles. And so the deputy sheriff who picks up a person who's obviously decompensating has nothing to do but bring that person to jail. And then the county sheriff says, what am I supposed to do with them? So, at the state level and at the local level, a determination has to be made to create the, the systems and give police officers and judges the tools so that jail is not the only option available to them. And finally, to break the bank, as to drugs, and look, al al alcohol is as much a drug, and it's often a more serious drug, Quite frankly, I think we've, we've, to my satisfaction, proven that in the last 50 years, we're not winning the war on drugs. We've paid a terrible price for it. It has a, the war on drugs has a corrupting influence on our society, and we ought to declare victory and decriminalize drugs and, and tax them and regulate them and invest the money that we spend on imprisonment and enforcement on things like prevention and treatment. Um, you know, I grew up in a world where I didn't have to buckle my seatbelt. And to this day, I'll drive around without my seatbelt on. My children grew up in a world where they would never dream of not buckling their seatbelt. We've, we've bent the curve, the curve on, on seatbelt use. We've bent the curve on smoking. We've even bent the curve on picking up after your dog. So if we can train a whole generation of people to pick up their dog's poop, I bet we could probably deal at least, and I don't think we'd be any worse off than we are today. There, I've said it. <laughs> Paul won't forgive me. Um, I'm interested in knowing um, what gives you hope that anything is going to change in the near future, and by the near future, I'm talking about in the next 10 or 20 years, aside from your experience in New York. Uh, the fact that you are all here this evening. I think, I, I, I think it's going to take longer than 20 years. It took us the 200 years of our republic to create the system that we have. Uh, it's naive to think we're going to disassemble it overnight, and I think 10 or even 20 years is the equivalent of overnight. But I see throughout the country, I, you know, it's very interesting. Ever since those pictures came out about Abu Ghraib, the whole issue of what kind of a people we are and what our own prisons are like has really moved up in the national consciousness. And people talk about it all over, not just here. Um, there are organizations, the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, is, is doing some remarkable work at ending the practice of solitary confinement. Um, a group called Just Detention International did a tremendous job uh, getting Congress to pass the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, but it's, it's slow and it's arduous and, um, and it, it, as I say, it doesn't reach most of the county jails. I, 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 I am less concerned about state prisons than I am about the county jails around this country. They're really awful places. So, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, and thank everybody for coming. See you next year.